Like a point on the horizon, where the faster you drive towards it, the further it seems. The appeal of Nicolas Cage is in the pursuit. He's something you can't pin down, an energy that refuses to be caught and boxed up neatly. He's an enigma. In 2014, the soon-to-be Yahoo original cult classic community put out the episode Introduction to Teaching, and it captured the core debate that's fascinated the internet for decades. Nicolas Cage, good or bad? And the answer to me, it doesn't matter. Only the question does. Sure, it might be cliche internet culture now at this point, but the story of Nick Cage is a book that's never quite finished. In the last year alone, he put out a genuine Oscar-worthy performance in Pig that was immediately followed with a movie about Nick Cage, played by Nick Cage, about being Nick Cage. He's getting self-aware. And like Abed, the more you dig into the question, into the essence of the man himself, the more you get sucked in. That's exactly what happened to me. In college, I took an English class on film studies, and in it, solely to make myself laugh, kind of like Abed, I decided I'd write every essay on the worst, weirdest Nick Cage movie I could find for the whole semester, to take nonsense seriously. I was shitposting my way through life back then, too. So a new assignment would come around, our professor would announce the topic, and I'd immediately find myself scrolling down Rotten Tomatoes, down, down, until I found the lowest rated Nick Cage movies possible. And then in some manic-like fugue state, I'd rant my way through a five-page essay on the mise-en-scene of Bangkok Dangerous, or the cinematography of Face Off. And it's the easiest time I've ever had writing essays. They'd flow out because of how entertaining it was to try and put words to whatever the hell Cage was trying to do on screen. To try and actually grasp the seemingly unknowable man. A man that almost transcended logic. Just pure fascination at his chaotic decisions. It was bewildering. It was addicting. Even in writing this essay, I spaced out into such a hyperfixation that I didn't realize my leg had fallen asleep, went to stand up, and almost knocked over the chair next to me. I mean, that might be undiagnosed ADHD, not Cage, but I think the intrigue of him still stands. He's been an Oscar winner in cult classic comedies and blockbusters, terrible action movies, small dramas, bizarre art house features. He's played both somebody in search of national treasure and possessed and sought them in real life. I'll give you 20,000 for it. In 2019, it came out that he was searching for the actual Holy Grail and once had to return a stolen T-Rex skull to the government of Mongolia. I gave it to him, but I never got my money back. He has confused, shocked, engaged, and bewildered the internet for years. That's because Cage transcends traditional celebrity. The idea of Nick Cage is its own entity, separate from the actual man, intrinsically linked, but the persona is its own person. It's like kayfabe and wrestling where reality and gimmick are so linked that they blur. The idea that, yeah, it's fake, but that's the point. The point is buying in. The facade is the main attraction. The real becomes the fake becomes inseparable. It's like Andy Kaufman, Joe Para, absurdist comedians, and professional wrestlers. When does the character end and the person start? And when does one form the other to the point that it's seemingly inseparable? So it's a weird conundrum, and it's a paradox that's inherent to celebrity itself, but especially for Nick Cage. And maybe this is all pure happenstance of the ebb and flow of a career, or or maybe Cage is in control and refused to let his career be locked inside his last name. There's also something to be said that, as a Coppola, Nick Cage has a career that can't die. Superman can afford to jump off a cliff when he knows he can fly. His real name is Nicholas Kim Coppola. His uncle is the five-time Oscar-winning director behind The Godfather and Apocalypse Now, who married Nick's Emmy-winning director, Aunt Eleanor. And don't forget Aunt Talia, Talia Schreier, aka Adrian and Rocky, who also has an Oscar. Oh, and her son, Nick's cousin, Jason Schwartzman, who you might have seen in every Wes Anderson movie, who himself co-directed Moonrise Kingdom with Nick's other cousin, Roman. And don't forget that other cousin, Sophia Coppola, who got a Best Director nom for her movie Lost in Translation and used to be married to Spike Jones. Collectively, the Coppola family has 23 Academy Award nominations. So that's why you witness these year-long dry spells that would send any other actor into obscurity that never seem to sink in. He has his career invincibility that lets him bob and weave his way through flops and B-movies and weird risks and phoning it in, just long enough for him to occasionally find gold. And thankfully, that pursuit of gold leaves a trail of ridiculous absurdity in its wake. His career reminds me of creativity itself. When you take enough at-bats, you'll occasionally strike inspiration and stumble into the sublime. If you're a photographer who sets out to take photos every day for a thousand days, somehow, on day 567, You'll wander across a moment, one never to be seen or recreated again, where forces outside of your control inspire to put you in front of this combination of humanity, so beautiful, you swear you've struck gold when you hit the shutter. And then you'll keep going, 
and be back to taking an uninspired shot of a boring building down the street on day 568. You don't know what will happen, and it's all out of your control, but in the doing, you find the meaning. Understanding Cage is fully impossible. It's like water trying to grab the ocean. It's like two opposite ends of a magnet reaching out for one another. But to me, it's the pursuit that's the point. Thanks for watching.